Okay, welcome everyone. Um, if you didn't sign in, remember to go ahead and do that. There are six forms in the back. It doesn't matter which one you use. You'll get counted if you sign in. Is there a question in the back? My office hours are found on the syllabus. Uh, today, my office hours are from 10.30 till noon. I also have them on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, I think it's um, starting at 12.30 on both days. Okay, uh, this is the Malau Viaduct. This is a really kind of famous bridge that's been recently unveiled in France. And uh, in some ways it looks a little bit like the bridge that we've got here in Huntington because of the um, unique shape of it. But like I said, each week we'll just have a, a highlight of an engineering marvel to kick things off. Uh, we've got a lot of speakers though today, so we'll just jump right into these announcements. First of all, there is a chapter meeting coming up for ASCE, SAME, and freshmen are definitely invited. The attendance has been really good so far at those meetings, and you're encouraged to get involved, and um, you can have, you can socialize and learn at the same time, and that's not always the case, so it's a great opportunity, um, and it's pizza provided at that meeting, right? Okay, so Thursday the 18th, 5 p.m., uh, there's also a concrete canoe meeting, and I've been assured that they're still accepting new members to help out with the concrete canoe team. Even if you don't like rowing, they're going to need a lot of help building that concrete canoe. So there's something to do for everyone with that. The next meeting for them is going to be on Tuesday the 23rd at 6. And as previously announced, Steel Day is going to be a week from today, and you could make it over there have a look and be back in time for class. There's a group of students that are going to be leaving the engineering lab building at 1045. They'll stay about an hour and then you can come back and hear next week's speaker. So any questions for the announcements? Yeah. Oh, that's wrong. Thank you for noticing that. I update the slide each week and I didn't update the date. So that is going to be open after I write the questions for today's quiz and then it'll be open through 11 o'clock next week. Thanks for noticing that. Um, seems like everybody's been doing pretty well on those multiple choice quizzes so far. Again, my goal is to make it as easy as possible, uh, but at the, still, at the same time, um, reward you for paying attention during our presentations here in class. All right, so today I am very happy to let you know we're going to have another BSC faculty member introduce himself to you. This week it's uh, Dr. Andrew Nichols. And then uh, after he concludes, I'll turn the time immediately over to our four speakers for today. It is uh, four students who are reporting the internships that they did this summer. Dr. Nichols. So I'm glad to be your in engineering marvel for today to start the class off. I've already failed because I put that this was uh, Engineering 103 and not uh, Engineering 104. So. Well, this is 103. It is 103? Yeah, this is 103. Okay. Did I start off? Did I start off slow? Yeah. Good start. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm Andrew Nichols. Welcome to Marshall University. Welcome to Engineering. I hope to see uh, many of these faces in four or five years walking across the aisle to get your uh, engineering degree at Marshall and if not, engineering, another degree at Marshall. So a little bit about myself. I grew up in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Do we have any Point Pleasant alumni in here? All right. So I graduated from Point Pleasant High School, uh, then went to WGU to get my Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Marshall didn't have engineering at that time, so or of course I would have come to Marshall and made the same great decision that you all have made. Uh, so I completed that degree at WVU then went to Purdue University for my master's and my uh, PhD. Uh, I taught for three years at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, and then I've been at Marshall since 2007 and plan to be here until I retire someday. So of course, those of you who aren't from around here, uh, Point Pleasant is famous for the Mothman. Has anybody seen the Mothman prophecies? Has anybody been to the Mothman Festival? So if you're looking for something to do on some weekend in September, does anybody from Point Pleasant remember the date? Is it this coming weekend or two weekends? Nobody? No Mothman fans in here? So Point Pleasant's just an hour up the road 
and you can go to the Mothman Festival. This is the actual statue that's there, and you can get your picture taken with the Mothman statue, and you can take hay rides into the TNT area where most of the Mothman sightings occurred. Of course, Point Pleasant, from an engineering standpoint, is better known for the uh, Silver Bridge collapse. Of course, in the movie, The Mothman Prophecies, they try to link the, moth link the Mothman uh, with the Silver Bridge collapse. Of course, if you haven't seen The Mothman Prophecies, that was kind of a spoiler alert because that's kind of what happens at the end of the movie. Uh, but Silver Bridge, if you stay in engineering, this is something that you'll probably study or talk about in one of your later uh, structural engineering classes or even in intro to engineering class. So my specific uh, discipline, of course, if you haven't already heard about these this semester, you're going to be likely hearing about the different engineering disciplines that you can go into. Um, I'm civil engineering within that group, and so within civil engineering, you have environmental, hydrology, uh, geotech, structures, and transportation. So my specific area within that is uh, transportation. So all things, mostly I deal with highway transportation. Transportation itself can be air, rail. Uh, water, barges, things like that. I specifically deal with the uh, highway segment. So it's uh, geometric design of roadways, uh, traffic operations, traffic signal timings, things of that nature. So the courses that I teach or have taught, so I have done uh, Engineering 102, which probably most of you, if you haven't already taken it, will be taking that uh, next semester. So that's learning how to use microstation software for doing computer-aided design. Uh, engineering economy, I've taught that in the past. I haven't taught, taught it in a couple of years. Uh, senior design, I help out with the senior design on the transportation section. And then I'm also responsible for geomatics, although I'm not teaching it this current semester for the first time in a few years, which is essentially surveying. I'll probably be back to that next fall. Uh, intro to transportation engineering is the main course that I'm responsible for, as well as highway design. And then for our graduate program, I also teach uh, traffic engineering, which is traffic signals and traffic signals and things related to uh, operations. So my research, I am heavily involved with research, mostly with the uh, West Virginia Department of Transportation. So intelligent transportation system. This is a picture of a. Uh, message signs that are located on the uh, interstates that say accident ahead or be alert, all those are controlled by this system that we have access to. And West Virginia 511, this is the key chapter of the West Virginia 511. West side of it, you can go on and look at why traffic conditions during the 1970s <coughs> go up during the uh, 60s. So if you're not familiar with 511, I'm sure most of you drive now. Uh, it's a good resource to check and see if there's, you can call 511 as well as uh, using the website to, to get some of that information. We also do a lot with traffic signals. This screen right here shows one of the systems that we use to uh, operate and manage the traffic signals. We're responsible for uh, the traffic signals along 3rd Avenue and 5th Avenue and a lot of the signals that are on this side of the, the viaduct here in Huntington and we manage some traffic signals uh, all across the state actually right now. I also do a lot with an analyzing crash report data. We just finished up a report looking at deer vehicle collisions in the state of West Virginia. We're ranked annually, uh, or have been ranked for the last six years, number one in the United States for the probability of a driver in West Virginia for hitting a deer. And so we did a project to try to identify where the hot spots were across the state and look to see if there's any sort of mitigation that can be put in to try to uh, reduce the number of deer vehicle collisions that occur in, in those spots. We also do a lot with data collection sensors that are installed in and around the roadway for counting cars and measuring speeds and things like that. So I, I frequently hire undergraduates to work on my research projects and so if that's something that might be of interest to you, feel free to uh, stop by and talk to me sometime. So my interests and hobbies, um, I'm keep getting older, but I, I feel like I can still do what I did when I was in high school and college in terms of playing sports, and so I'm frequently limping, limping around the office and uh, uh, hurt. But I play soccer in an adult league. Uh, I play basketball over at the rec center with a group of uh, faculty. Uh, I also play racquetball with some students. I've not played with any of you guys, but there's some students that play racquetball that I play with. I golf, I hunt, I fish, I snow ski, and then beach vacations. And this is a picture of my 
uh, this summer we were down at uh, Myrtle Beach and this is our shark tooth collection that we found uh, across the course of a week uh, this summer at Myrtle Beach. So we we're pretty proud of that one large one right in the middle of the plate. We were pretty successful this year. Uh, so advice for new students. Um, in terms of academic success, I mean, you guys, it's all on you to kind of take control of your academic career. And what I mean by that is attending class and doing your work, especially for the classes that I teach, but I think you pretty much say this for all the engineering classes anyway, you need to be in class and you need to do the homework. That's the reason we give you the homework is so that you can learn the material, practice it, and then do well on the exam. And if you don't come to class, it's gonna be kind of hard to get that information. Uh, Marshall has tutoring and help resources. A lot of our engineering students, students starting out in engineering, calculus is one of the main reasons that they don't make it in engineering and there are resources for math tutoring that are out there and they're very useful. Even if you're, you don't like your instructor, you're struggling in the class and don't think you're, you're gonna make it before you just completely give up, uh, try to take advantage of those tutoring resources. And then all the, you're all assigned an academic advisor, which is one of the engineering faculty. And we're here, don't feel like you're uh, a burden to us. Now obviously if you come and meet with, try to talk to us and meet with us every day, that might become a burden. Uh, but we're here to help you and we're here to help uh, guide you and advise you on your choices that you make for your courses and things like that. So your freshman year, you're required to come see us whenever it's registration time, but don't disappear after that. I mean, we're there and you should be meeting with us every semester and making sure you're gonna be taking the right classes. If you have a question about dropping a class and the impact, uh, that's why we're there. So don't be afraid to uh, contact us and come meet with us. Uh, get out and get involved. It's really hard for freshmen and sophomores to sometimes get involved in like student chapter activities, which uh, these guys in the front here have been involved in for a number of years. And anybody who's involved in ASCE will tell you that that's a valuable experience as a student uh, because you kind of get away from the books and, and get a chance to apply what you're learning, but also the collaboration with your uh, classmates. So get out, get involved as much as you can. And then finally, and I kind of say this in wake of the whole uh, fraternity fire truck incident that occurred this summer and has been in the news this week, uh, but you guys are all adults now. And for some of you, this is the first freedom that you've really had in your life. Uh, just don't screw it up and make, make responsible decisions and uh, make your family proud, and don't make us look bad. You can Google it on the news. The <laughs> it, it's been in the news this week in the Herald Dispatch and the local news, but there was a the fire truck that sits in, out in front of one of the fraternity houses got set on fire this summer. So my contact info is here. Uh, feel free, especially a number of you probably have me as your advisor, and in fact, I probably got an email from one or two of you today wanting to set up a meeting. Uh, like I said, that's what I'm here for. Even if I'm not your advisor and you're interested in transportation or interested in the research that I'm doing, uh, feel free to send me an email or give me a phone call and uh, we can set up a meeting to talk. And I'm pretty sure this is my office number. I'm right next to Dr. Waite's office. I should know what my own office number is. It's somewhere over there in the engineering lab. So that's all I have. Anybody have any specific questions now before you hear from the uh, four additional gentlemen that are going to talk to you? <coughs> Uh, so if you go on to, actually, you guys want to handle this? So my MU, so it's it's in my MU student tab, and it should list there who your academic advisor is. But it's certainly my MU somewhere in my MU. Other questions? Your next engineering marvel you'll hear from. <laughs> but he's a marvel of some sort. I don't know. Humility, you're out. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is David Cooper, and I'm just going to share with you my experience as an intern project engineer. Uh, before I get too far into my presentation, I'm just going to let you know that I'm probably going to use some terms that you might have not come across yet. Um, and if you have a technical question, I'll be more than happy to answer it after class, but I'm not really going to get too technically involved in this presentation. The first question is how did I actually get my internship? Um, I started out by deciding, 
for picking out a specific project that I knew I wanted to work on, had a direct interest in a specific project. Um, turned out that that project was a federally, federally owned facility, and so the United States Army Corps of Engineers was the residing officer on that project. Um, through SAME and ASCE, I was able to make a professional contact with an employee at the Corps of Engineers. And he unfortunately informed me that the Corps of Engineers was not hiring interns at that time. But he was able to give me the direct contact info for the contractor that was on that specific job site. Uh, I began by approaching the contractor with a phone call and simply just asking if they were looking for interns. Uh, unfortunately, they had said they were not looking for interns and they actually never had an intern on that job site, but that I could go ahead and send them an e uh, an re a resume and they would take a look at it. Luckily for me, it took them two or three days, and they called me back and told me they'd like to come in for an interview. And when I, when I went in for my interview, they offered me a job. The company I worked for this summer was Brandon Construction Corporation. It's a heavy civil and geotechnical contractor located in Saxonburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, they've been providing the industry with innovative solutions since 1947. They started out as a family-owned business with uh, two brothers, and it is now a nationally recognized and they handle public and private sector clients. They specialize in steel erection, demolition, drilling and grouting, marine piling, caissons, bridges, and dam safety assurance projects. The specific job site that I wanted to work on is the, the Bluestone Dam in Kent, West Virginia. It's a safety assurance project. Uh, how many people in here have any idea where this dam is at? Okay. Um, as you can tell from this picture, it's completely functional, it's completely up and running, there's nothing wrong with it. But inside this red box is kind of an area that doesn't look like it's being used. That's because when the dam was originally designed, they had planned to put a hydroelectric generator in that area. Um, times have changed, uh, demands have changed, and now there's no need for a hydroelectric generator there. So they have tr uh, decided to turn this into uh, a dam safety project. The dam safety project uh, phase three includes these blue gates, which are emergency fence stops. Uh, they basically work as like a check valve or a safety check valve for the entire lake. If the pressure behind the dam gets too too, too much and the dam's gonna fail, if it doesn't enough these fence stops, then that will relieve the pressure. Uh, specifically in phase three, they are installing training walls and scour protection or stealing basin. Training walls basically just make the water, they train the water to go in a certain direction. And as we'll learn later, water is extremely powerful and can be extremely destructive. And so it requires uh, scour protection to slow it down so that it doesn't erode the area of the river bed. Some cool facts about this project, um, specifically phase three just in itself, it took one phase of this project, a $58 million contract. Currently using number 18 gauge rebar, which makes Bluestone Dam the biggest rebar project on the East Coast. All of those big slabs of concrete that you saw, or all of those big slabs of concrete that you see behind me are called monoliths. And to keep those monoliths, monoliths of concrete anchored to the ground and keep them from being washed away, they have to be anchored with three inch uh, post tension bar anchors and 17 inch, 20 inch post tension strand anchors. Everything on this job is considered a mass concrete job, and a lot of the mixing even included aggregate all the way up to 10 inches, which is pretty substantial for, for concrete. And the Corps has actually classified this as a mega project. The picture on the left is a picture of a post or a yeah, a post tension bar anchor. The reason I put this picture on there is because the majority of my work this summer has been tech supply stuff to be able to do the plumbing. concerning with bar anchors. And when I went to Brandon, I didn't even know what a bar anchor was. So that's kind of what my summer led me to be able to do. Uh, the big side is a bar anchor is you drill a hole, put a big piece of metal down, and grout it, and that tensions the top. And then you, you tighten the nut at the top, and that tensions the entire bolt. From a professional aspect, some of the things that I learned is that you don't have to wear a suit and a tie to be A, professional, or B, powerful. The guys that I was, was working with every day showed up in jeans and t-shirts, 
they were still making million dollar decisions literally every day. Um, another thing to keep in mind is be nice to everyone. You might not like some of the guys in your office, but one of these days you might be working for them or they might be working for you. So you don't want something that happened five years ago to affect your all's relationship later on down the road. Um, another thing that is important is meeting manners. If you are privileged enough as a spoken to in a meeting, just don't give them your full name because they're probably not worried about it. Uh, you also need to know how to talk to people who are not engineers. On a daily basis, you're going to be talking to suppliers, you're going to be talking to clients, you're going to be talking to people in the community, and it's important to be able to take what you know as an engineer, your advanced knowledge as an engineer, and be able to <coughs> tone it down to where the, the normal person, the average Joe employee, would know what you're talking about. And that's important because you need to respect everybody on the job site. Whether you're in a design firm or whether you're working for a contractor like I was, you're going to be around people that don't have college degrees and you're going to be around people that are not as book smart as you. So don't let that fool you because that does not mean that they aren't as smart as you and it does not mean they aren't making the money you make. So respect everybody you work for. And then the last thing I learned professionally is that you have to be friends, to, you have to have friends to be successful. Uh, when bosses go to get promotions, they're going to get to the people that they have the best relationships with. So go out to dinner with people after work. Try to invite people to go and play golf. Get to know people that you work with outside of work, not just you know, nine to five here in work. Uh, my normal work day, I'll get up at 5.15, leave at 5.45, and drive 45 minutes to work. We have an engineering meeting at 6.45. At 7, everybody would be on site for safety briefing. At 7.30 was when we actually got to start work. Um, from an engineering standpoint, 50% in the office, 50% on site. At 12 o'clock is whenever we'd have lunch with the office staff. One o'clock was normally reserved every day for our, our weekly meeting. And then at 5.30, I'd head home. On a not so normal work day, uh, because this was a mass concrete job, we had to pour very large sums of concrete during the night because we had to control the temperature of the concrete. If on the, the days when we poured concrete, I, being an intern, got to be one of the guys that came in to test the concrete. On a not so normal work day, I'd get up at 11.15 p.m. at night, uh, leave at 11.45, I'd make it to work for an engineering meeting at 12.45 in the morning. At 1 o'clock, we'd be outside for a safety briefing, and at 1.30, we'd actually start testing concrete. At about 5 a.m., we might get a chance between two trucks to stop and grab some food, and then we might get another chance at about 12 to stop and get lunch, just between concrete trucks. Uh, at 1 o'clock, it was still reserved for weekly meetings, so if you had a meeting with somebody, you still had to be able to keep your eyes open and go to your meeting and be functional. And then at 2 o'clock, I'd finally get to go home, making it back at about 2.45, which was 15 hours after I left that. Uh, some general advice from my summer experience. You only get one first impression, so make it count. Um, if you're going to call somebody on the phone, if you're going to send them an email, if you're going to shake their hand at a, some sort of conference or an ASE event, make sure you make it count because they're going to remember that forever. The next thing is try to find something that you're truly interested in. I knew that I was interested in uh, geotechnical and heavy sales uh, or projects. And so the only heavy civil project in southern West Virginia was a bluestone dam. And that's why I focused on that. Find something that you're interested in and try to get involved. Sometimes a phone call makes a bigger impact than an email. Um, several people at Brandon have told me that the reason I got my internship was because I called them and I was the one that asked for the internship. Had I sent them an email probably would have just ignored it and not never even taken notice that I wanted to work there. And that, that leads right into be assertive, volunteer for responsibilities, and challenge yourself. Don't wait for your employer to give you a job. Don't wait for your employer to give you a responsibility at work. Volunteer, jump in. If you see something that you don't know how to do that you think you can learn, volunteer for it and make yourself, you know, work the extra time after work to learn what it takes to, to do that sort of stuff. It really shines later on down the Get outside of your comfort zone and keep an open mind. You'll be able to get to a job site and it not be something that you want to do or it might be something that you don't think you want to do, but by the end of it, you may love it. Or by the end of it, you may hate it. But one way or the other, you're going to learn whether or not you like that field of study. And then the most important thing for an intern, without question, is don't be late. There aren't many things that an employer can judge you on, but they can definitely tell whether or not you're late. So don't be late. 
And then, most importantly, don't forget to have fun and make friends along the way. I can honestly say that I might have worked 25 to 50 hours a week and drove an hour and a half to work every day, but I had more fun this summer and met some of the coolest people that I've ever met because of my internship. So, uh, I know we're running a little low on time, so instead of asking for questions now, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the next guy. about me. I'm Levi Whitehead. I'm a senior in uh, engineering. I'm from Nitro. When I graduate, hopefully in May, I uh, plan to pursue a master's in nuclear engineering. Um, I'm the professional development coordinator of our student chapter, and I am the school bridge team captain. Uh, where I work this summer, Newport News Shipbuilding, uh, they design overhaul, refuel, decommission the nuclear powered aircraft carriers and submarines for the United States Navy. Uh, Newport News, um, it's, it's called a peninsula in eastern Virginia, it's about an hour from Richmond, um, 15, 30 minutes from Virginia Beach. We got 24,000 employees, uh, they work around the clock, but 90% of them work first shift, 7 a.m. to 4. My manager was Kevin Arden. He's the head structural engineer for aircraft carrier new construction. Uh, his depart our department, EO2, and with central engineering, all the other 90 engineering departments feed into us, and my department kind of made the big decisions on projects. Well, that wasn't me, of course, but that's what my boss did. Uh, some projects I did. Um, uh, procedure to install armor windows on the aircraft carrier Island House. I learned a new program called FEMAF. It's a way to uh, apply loads and constraints to an object you want to analyze. And then you use uh, another program called NASTRAN, and it runs the calculations to find uh, your weaknesses on what you're trying to look at. Uh, I did some recon analysis, reinforced concrete in the foundry. Uh, they have molds that they make. Uh, big metal objects out of, and the molds are made out of sand and binder with some rebar in it, so it's basically reinforced concrete. Uh, I did a hull displacement analysis. Uh, ships are under the buoyant load <coughs> from the water and then the load of actually how much the ship weighs on top of it. So you had to uh, check the displacement on the ship at all times. And then um, another FEMAP analysis is a shock analysis on reheat steam piping in the main condenser that was in the engine room of the, the forward aircraft carrier. Uh, my typical work day is pretty much routine. That was nice. It was the same thing every day. It wasn't like David. But um, wake up 5.30, go to work about 7. 7 to noon, I would. that's when I do a lot of my analysis work, the computer work, Excel files, stuff like that. Uh, after lunch was when the meetings were. I would go with Kevin to uh, a lot of the meetings and we'd update the managers on what we're doing. That's whenever I would visit the shipyard and the foundry and I'd have to talk to people in there. Tuesdays I took a night class, it's called Shipyard Operations, uh, by far one of the coolest things I've ever done. Uh, it was 4.30 to 7 and then weekends, it was nice being out there, you had Bush Gardens, uh, Water Country USA, Virginia Beach, the Outer Banks, I mean it was a lot of fun. The new construction, the new aircraft carrier is a CVN-78. CVN stands for Carrier Vessel Nuclear. Uh, the 78 aircraft carrier the United States Navy has had it is a new class of carrier. The, old, the last class was the Nimitz class. Basically, when you change enough stuff from the last ship to the new ship, they're going to make it a new class. Uh, the Ford went from three aircraft elevators to two had what they call EMALS, Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch System. Uh, the last launch systems were, they were launching with steam. Now they launch with electromagnets. Um, oops, it's the wrong one. RCOH is a, I forget that word every time, refueling and complex overhaul. And currently they are doing that on CVN-72 Abraham Lincoln. Um, 
A ship's whole lifespan is 50 years, but every 25 years they have to refuel the nuclear material. And when they come in for that, they also update all the electronics, the computer systems, and uh, basically re-gut the ship. Um, that is a four to five year project, it's about $7 billion. The new aircraft carriers, they take about 11 to 12 years to complete, and it's $13 billion. That's with a B. Um, and actually this year, oh, that's the wrong number. Oh, okay. Well, uh, they decommissioned the Enterprise. It's the first nuclear-powered uh, aircraft carrier we've ever had. It lasted, it was 50 years of service. They decommissioned it this summer. Uh, I did not take this photograph. But um, it has eight nuclear reactors, which makes it different from all the other ones since it. All the carriers now have two reactors, and decommissioning it means you have to take apart the reactors, you gut the whole ship, then you leave send it to Seattle, and then that's when they cut the ship up and try to reuse the steel. <coughs> they also build uh, nuclear-powered submarines. This one actually just launched last week, uh, SSN 785 John Warner. It is a Virginia-class submarine. That's a reconnaissance submarine. It's not an ICBM submarine. Uh, but it still packs a heavy punch when it comes to weapons. They also are testing a mounted laser on this sub because when it comes to submarines, they got two modes. It's either kill you or don't kill you. And they've tried this laser on it, so if they have pirates or somebody following them, they'll shine the laser on them and burn them until they leave them alone, which is better, in my opinion, than getting blown to smithereens. And uh, VASIC, that stands for... Virginia Advanced Shipbuilding and Carrier Integration Center. Um, they are constantly doing research here. Uh, currently, right now, they're trying to create jet fuel out of seawater. It's been successful, but they just have to now get it on a large-scale production. Uh, they also do uh, augmented reality. This is pretty sweet, because I saw this. You take an iPad, and say you're going in a room to build something, and you hold the iPad up, it shows you what you have to do. It shows you where the pipes go. It shows you how to put the pipe in there. It shows you where everything goes. So they're trying to augment reality, basically an entire ship, so you can build a ship with an iPad. Um, what, VASIC? Virginia Advanced Shipbuilding and Carrier Integration Center. Welcome. Uh, also, in this building, they run um, extensive logistic programs and 3D modeling to improve efficiency and cost of building these ships. You're probably wondering what Huntington Ingalls is. That is the parent company of Newport News Shipbuilding. They, they have about four or five other shipyards in the United States. But uh, Huntington Ingalls and Basic is located in Newport News, right on the shipyard property. My advice, uh, I'm not blowing smoke here, join our student chapter. I would not have had this internship and a job because they offered me a job after I graduate. They're paying for grad school. I would not have any of that had it not been through our student chapter. I met my manager, Kevin Harden, at our winter technical conference last year. Uh, our pro professor, Jeff Huffman, um, connected us and we got to talking and I got an internship through that. Communicate with others, you have to establish connections. I don't care how smart you are, if you can't talk to people, if you can't make connections with people, you're not gonna get anywhere. You have to talk to people. And I know for me, that was a big deal because I sat in this room four years ago, up in the corner, and I didn't wanna talk to anyone. Uh, I don't wanna talk to you all right now because I get stage fright, so, but I'm slowly getting over that. And I encourage you all to know how to communicate. Take chances. Uh, I had some other internships I could have done this summer, <coughs> stayed at home, done the normal thing, rather than pack up, move six hours away, live on my own for three months in a whole new environment. Didn't know what was gonna happen, but I absolutely loved it, and I got a job out of it. So definitely take chances. An internship is only temporary. It's not gonna last your whole life. So if it's Arizona for three months, go do it. You might love it. Start interning now. Winter break, if you've got a job you can do, go do it for a month. Uh, this summer, do it. My first, uh, my freshman summer, I interned at uh, IBS Hydro. It's in 
Institute, and I, I just labored. I mean, I literally carried blocks all day. But I interacted with people, I knew the industry, and it was a great experience that I could put on my resume and potentially build up to this job I had this summer. And the last point is build a resume. Do things that you can add to that resume. Brag on yourself. That's the one piece of paper it's okay to brag on yourself. It's fine. That's Tell cool. people what you do, what you know, and you go from there. Thank you for your time. My name is Corey Gibbs. I'm a se also a senior engineering student here at Marshall. Uh, I don't have any submarines or lasers to talk about, but I did work with something you're probably a little more comfortable with, and that's bridges. Um, so this summer, I got an internship at Michael Bridges Corporation, and they um, they're a international firm <coughs> with over 90 offices across the U.S. and they um, provide engineering and consulting consulting services um, with just about anything you can imagine terms of engineering as far as planning and project management to architectural aspects to the construction um, portion and uh, they gross over 1.3 billion dollars a year so we're talking about a pretty big company here personally I worked out of Cross Lanes West Virginia um, I worked with all the structural engineers there in the structural department working primarily with bridges um, I worked everything from bridge design to bridge inspection and um, bridge uh, in terms of bridge design, I did a lot of um, design work in bridge abutments and lean walls doing the inside of the concrete. You have spill reinforcement. And I designed, um, I figured out and designed exactly how much spill you need in those abutments to, to stabilize the bridge. Um, another thing I did was I worked a lot with checking other people's work since I'm not actually a professional engineer. A lot of times uh, they would come into my office and uh, hand me these set of plans say, you know, go through and double check all these, make sure I didn't make any stupid mistakes. And um, so that was kind of cool, just getting to look over their work. Um, another thing I did was I did initial calculations for girders and stringers under uh, several small bridges they were doing, uh, which normally is kind of good. That's basically just the beams that run along the bottom of the bridge. <coughs> another aspect of my job this summer was I did bridge inspection. Bridge inspection is one thing a lot of firms have started to pick up, especially in West Virginia, because particularly in West Virginia, there's not a lot of design work going on right now just because uh, the money's not really there. But um, basically, every bridge that you've ever driven across pretty much annually has to be inspected. And with those inspections come inspection reports. And that was the bulk of what I did this summer was work on bridge inspection reports for railroads, uh, highways, bridges, just about any bridge you can imagine. East Huntington Bridge that um, Dr. Lowe was talking about at the beginning of the class with the cables. If you've ever been over there, you've seen it. Um, I helped put together the report for that. I didn't actually go on that inspection. But um, I did get to go on several big inspections this summer, which I'll talk about here in a moment. And that was another cool part about my internship was I got to work with both the office and the crew. So the, brig the two biggest bridge inspections I went on was um, the Donald Legg Memorial Bridge and the Williamstown Marietta Bridge. Uh, if you've ever driven between Huntington and Charleston, you've been across the Donald Leg Bridge, which spans between uh, across the Canal River between Nitro and St. Albans. And uh, going back to what David said first about working a kind of funny schedule, that was actually the first two weeks I started, and they told me uh, to show up at 8 p.m. to the bridge. And uh, so that was kind of weird for me. I worked 8 p.m. to 4 a.m., 5 a.m. And uh, the reason we had to do that was because picture on the left here, I took myself from a man lift, and that's, I was up on top, on the top man to the bridge, uh, inspecting all the members up there, but because of the heavy traffic on that bridge, you, you can't only close lanes at nighttime, so that you don't back up traffic. So that was kind of odd getting used to, but it was really cool being able to go up and um, look for all the defects on that bridge and everything. Um, the other big bridge I did was the William Tom Marietta Bridge. It spans the, Ohio, the entire Ohio River, so it's a huge bridge, and it's between Williamstown, West Virginia, and Marietta, Ohio. Uh, that bridge, we actually went, and I got to stay in Marietta, Ohio, in a hotel, and I mean, they paid for my hotel, and I had per, per diem for my meals every day, and that was uh, really cool 
So I think we were up for four days inspecting that bird. I also took the picture on the right there, and um, that is taken from a super, they call it a super truck. And it's basically a truck that sits on top of the deck of the bird and has a series of booms that takes you up, down, or up, outside, and down under the bridge. So you can look at all those uh, stringers and girders along the bottom of the bridge and uh, look at all the defects under there. Uh, lessons I learned this summer. Uh, like I was saying with the concrete design, I got to do a little bit of design with the abutments and wing walls on the bridges. Uh, I'd had a reinforced concrete design class before, but it was mostly doing book problems and it, it wasn't, it didn't seem very practical at the time, but once, uh, it was kind of intimidating when they first handed me just this blank sheet and said, okay, put, put the reinforcement in this bridge abutment. And uh, so I was kind of scared at first, but they were really good about helping me through that. And I got to apply a lot of the things I learned in that reinforced concrete design class to actually uh, design that abutment. Uh, technical report presentation. That's a big thing in engineering. Uh, it's, you can see bridges and everything, and it's, a, it's fun being out on the job sites, but just about everything you do in engineering is going to have to be written up at one point. And uh, in some of your later classes, particularly with uh, Professor Jeff Huffman, you'll learn about technical reports. And although they're not fun, they're very necessary. <coughs> so that was, uh, I got to prepare a lot of those this summer and learn about exactly how different companies want their reports to be prepared. Probably when I learned the most was out on each inspection. Uh, I was always with one of the other inspectors, uh, with one of the other inspectors, uh, Chuck Hill Engineer, and um, they were really good about you know just showing me different parts of the bridge when we were out there on it and um, just really elaborating on why they did this or why they don't do this anymore. Um, that Donald Leg Bridge was built in '69, I think, or late '60s, and so there's a lot of things that they pointed out that this is how they used to do it. I learned a lot just from being out there with other professional engineers. Uh, some more general concepts that I learned this summer was uh, you will not learn everything you need to know about your job that you're going to get while you're in school. Um, you know, you, you think the first job you land out of school, you go in thinking, hoping that you're going to be prepared for everything they give you. You probably won't be prepared for anything they give you. Um, as scary as that sounds, it's a lot of people tell you, you get your degree to get your job. And then once you get your job, that's when you really start learning. And um, that's particularly true. That was true in my case. I, a lot of stuff I did, uh, I didn't know how to do this summer. But they were really good with teaching me how to do it. And that's the best part about an internship. You know, they, your coworkers, they understand that you're just an intern and that you're not going to know everything that they want you to do. But as much as you're there to help the company, they're also there to help you learn. Uh, even large professional companies can be casual. Uh, like I said, Baker's a $1.3 billion company, but uh, I, I typically wear khaki pants and a polo every day just to, you know, to maintain a professional image, but it wasn't uncommon to see one of the Trubco guys come in in a baseball jersey. Uh, so it was, it was a really relaxed environment, and it was nice. And uh, like I was just saying, your coworkers can be your biggest fear too. Uh, I learned more about um, reinforced concrete design steel design, which is a class I haven't even taken yet. I learned more this summer than um, just from doing hands-on experience than I probably could in an entire semester of taking a class. Uh, advice I would give you all, uh, you've heard it over and over, but get involved with the student chapter. That's, um, I, I wouldn't have, like the others before me, I wouldn't have had this internship if it wouldn't have been for being so involved. Uh, it was towards the end of the last semester and I still didn't have anything lined up and uh, I approached one of our chapter advisor, Jeff Huffman, and he gave me uh, one of my coworkers over the summer's contact information. And I, sh I uh, sent him an email, and the next thing I knew, I was interviewing. Um, start work experience early. Like Levi said, uh, I know we both interned right after our freshman, freshman years of school. And you know, if you think you're not prepared or you're not going to be ready, um, that don't, that don't, don't approach it like that. You can, there's internships I said learning is a huge part of an internship so even if you're not prepared for it you learn a lot along the way but definitely try and get involved with an internship your, your first year out of school because that's one more thing you can add to your resume uh, make as many connections as possible early on 
while you're in school right now and, and uh, taking advantage of the student chapter, that's one of the few times that uh, you'll have all of these experiences just right here at your fingertips. Once you get out in the world and you, you take a job, it's going to be harder to, um, well, I won't say more difficult, but but it looks really good as if you're approaching a professional as a student and showing them that you're not scared to get out there and put your name out there and get your foot in the door. And uh, so that's a big thing is, is meet as many professionals, meet as many people, make as many connections as you can. Um, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you should probably learn more about that as you go on. But um, uh, yeah, definitely make as many connections as you can. Uh, maintain high academic standards. Work experience is obviously very, very important when it comes to resumes and getting a job. But um, this is why you're here. You, you wouldn't be in school if it wasn't for that. And if you don't, if you don't go to class or you don't keep your grades up, maintain those academic standards, um, none of the stuff you do is, is going to benefit. It's, if you never graduate, it's, it's not going to serve anything. Uh, learn how to network and socialize with partners. A lot of people look at engineers and uh, they think of people just to kind of you know, shy away, stay in their office, don't really get out and talk to people. But more and more, that's not really the case. Um, you know, Interaction is a huge part of engineering. Like David was saying, you're going to be, if you're out on a project, you're going to be talking to people all different kinds, all different faces of the world, and um, you just have to you have to learn how to how to how to interact with all different types of people. So that's all I have for right now. There's a picture of me just coming from break that I talked about earlier. But uh, since we're on a time crunch, kind of, if you have any questions after class, feel free to see any of us. Thank you, guys. Guys, I'm gonna talk till I'm done. You gotta leave. Good evening, I understand. Go out quietly, it's all I have. My name is Zachary Michael. I am a senior here at Marshall. Actually, a redshirt senior here at Jackson State. My first year. Came out five years on into this program. I'm from Bluefield, Virginia, West Virginia area. I have been with Marshall for the past four years. And I wanted to briefly talk about my intern experience this summer. I work for a firm, Pratt Engineering, out of Santa Alba, West Virginia. Uh, they have Some of the different things I did is I worked like 40% in the office, 60% out of the office. When I was in the office, I mainly worked on the floor, so marking up the roads and gutters for folks. Um, just still being in school, there's not much design work I can do. They, they gave me a couple projects to work on, such as I tried to design vehicles when I was here. I'm not a structural guy like these three guys are. I have a lot of stuff laying around my head. But I gave it a shot, and you know, I mean, they let me struggle through it. They taught me some lessons along the way. Um, Brand reports is probably my biggest thing that I would like to sell to a very large company. Brand board versus insurance and management. We focus on uh, the insurance company will hire Triad. We go out and mess with residences that are claiming to be burnt out and settling due to the mines and fires. We basically go in there, take a look around, take a lot of pictures, write up a good 40, 60 page report. <coughs> that's all I have to say. But that was kind of what I was in charge of. Other reports I did have Some of my field experience I got to learn this year is I was out on a drill rig for, I'd say, a total of three weeks out of the summer for mine. Um, I actually drilled milk, which is the guy that shovels up the mud and puts stuff under cow augers and sets them on the rig. I did that for a week at Toyota down in Buffalo, West Virginia. And I'll tell you what, guys, that's going to be mighty good experience to put you on for that kind of job. But I learned. I got to work with uh, people that are uh, 66 years old. They've been doing this their whole life. They taught me a lot, um, so when I was actually went out back on the drill rig to log the holes, I was able to kind of notice some things that they taught me. I know what the process we're going about is. I'm not just completely lost while I'm out there like a total tourist. So I got good experience on the geotechnical aspect. 
Yeah, yeah, I should have come down. Should have uh, come and turned it up.